So, uh, starting with the superior network and uh, specifically uh, what is the uh, activity of the uh, superior network. Uh, you have uh, phono articulation, you have uh, hand skill movement and also other function. So, starting with the first one, which is quite uh, peculiar for the human being, which is the articulation network, you can see that you have uh, immediately a couple of uh, structures that are interplaying all uh, together. And one, the ventral premotor and the Broca area, of course. Data from the literature coming mostly from low frequency data, uh, the data, the uh, historical data from uh, uh, Pengfield, uh, the most uh, recent one from Eddie Chang and Matthew Tate and Hugh Dufo, of course, showing a couple of, uh, uh, um, um, showing the uh, site of the different function in this uh, specific region. Uh, data from the monkey are telling us that uh, this region is uh, highly connected with the uh, uh, bulbar structure. You have the cortical bulbar tracts and the number of muscles that are in, in fact involved in uh, this function is uh, quite high, particularly in the human being. So it's not easy to study this intraoperatively. Uh, the key point is, in fact, to rule out the interplay between uh, the last effector, which is N1, and uh, the interplay, that is the ventral premotor, with the play of the Broca area with the other function, with the other structure, of course. We have done this uh, in a group of uh, 70 patients, as you can see, using low frequency technique and, and high frequency technique combined. And asking the patient to perform a very easy task uh, has uh, counting and object naming. And uh, what is uh, uh, peculiar of this study is the fact that we have uh, added also EMG recording of uh, articulatory muscle uh, in both uh, ipsilateral and contralateral side. And actually, we uh, choose a couple, uh, at least four different muscles on the left and the right side. The first question is, uh, this is the, a right setup to study art articulation and how articulation works. Uh, the second one, can you define a border between the, these different areas, at least from a functional point of view, not from an anatomical one? To address the first one, we uh, took uh, volunteers, uh, we connect the volunteers to, mass, to uh, EMG, and we asked the volunteers to repeat words. And uh, then we detected the EMG signal, and we uh, look at the power uh, frequency uh, of the single muscles, how the single muscles were in fact reacting when uh, a guy was saying a words and different words. And what we get out of all this work is that the, the fact that actually the effector is working in the same manner, whatever the type of words that you are saying. So it is something that is common. In fact, it's something that is derived from the monkey. Second step, can we found a functional borders between the different areas? Um, you, you can start uh, with the resting state. Uh, the patient is uh, resting. You can apply low frequency technique over the uh, M1, the ventral premotor and the Broca area. Is the right test? Not really, because you can see, you can get just a uh, uh, clear response from N1. So uh, the best one in this case is to go in the resting uh, condition uh, to the high frequency technique, which helps you really in detecting single structure, single uh, functional unit inside of this area. And what you can get, in, to make all the story very short, is the fact that you have a sort of a specialization from M1 and the ventral premotor in articulation that uh, are in which uh, N1 neurons are firing quite fast, uh, and in fact you need a very few current to uh, elicit any motor response. In case of ventral premotor, the response is much higher. You have also a lattice and shift, so there is a sort of, uh, spe uh, of uh, uh, specialization inside of this area. And it's not the only information because when you go to the Broca area, it's not possible to elicit any motor response in the resting condition. Um, 
what happens when instead a guy is performing a task, counting or naming? And what we uh, look at is in fact what was changing when, the, when you were interfering with the, the natural performance of a task in the different areas. You can see here the different, top, the, the different type of uh, uh, responses that you can get. And in fact, again, the type of approach in terms of neurophysiology was the same, power spectrum uh, analysis and mean of frequency. And actually what you have in N1 is uh, this pattern, this tonic activation that is recruiting according to time. If you look how the muscles are activated, you can see that they, there is a change in the partner, in the temporal partner of activation of the muscles. And also, you can see that the activity is the same in the right and in, in the left. So the dominant N1 is controlling both, uh, uh, both, uh, uh, both muscles in the left and in the, dominant, and in the right uh, larynx and face. What's about the ventral premotor? If you use EMG, you have three types of partner. You have a clonic-like one, like you can see here, that uh, if you ask the patient to perform the task and you apply the current there, you have actually mostly, in most of the case, dysarthria. Uh, and a little bit of uh, uh, vocalization. You may have uh, an inhibitory and excitatory partner, or you can have a totally inhibitory partner. Um, in both cases, if you hear the, uh, the patient, the patient mostly has, of course, dysarthria, but if you go inside of the EMG partner, you will see that the story is completely different. In fact, you, have, uh, you may have a clonic activation, like in this case, a inhibitory activation, like in this one, or a complete inhibition, like in this one. And what you can see is that this is uh, not located in the same place, is functionally segregated in different regions with an inhibitory partner that is just at the end of the uh, ventral premotor area. And you can see here that what the ventral premotor is doing is not to have a somatotopy, in fact, inside of the area, but what the, um, the ventral premotor has is a sort of function organization. This is telling you that the ventral premotor is controlling both muscles on, the, on both sides and is involved in motor programming. What about Broca area? You can stimulate uh, Broca area by using uh, the, uh, the same current that you are going to use for the ventral premotor and one, or a little bit higher, four milliamp on the medium. And in fact, in the first case, you are not going to elicit any speech arrest, any type of uh, uh, language uh, disturbance, I would say speech uh, disturbance. On the other hand, if you increase the current intensity, you are going to see an uh, inhibition. If you look at the type of inhibition, you can see that the temporal pattern of activation of the muscles is not changed. This is actually telling you that Broca area, in fact, is not totally involved in speech uh, programming, neither in speech controls. And in fact, the point is that uh, if you look uh, where we can elicit with higher current intensity, the block, the alteration, the inhibition, um, is just in this little area in front of the ventral premotor. And you need a lot of current to induce this. This is telling you that you are not stimulating the cortex, you are going down, you are going into the subcortical tracts. And in fact, from that area, you can, by RD, trace the, the tracts that you have there, and you can see that the connectivity appears. And in fact, what is important there is the subcortical connectivity. I think with this I give you the rationale in terms of neurophysiology to remove Broca area. The, the uh, point is that the same area is also involved in hand skill movement. These are the data from the monkey, the, the 
circuits for grasping uh, the sky by uh, Roger Lemon Group um, is clearly showing that there is a, a connectivity between the, the N1 and the ventral premotor in doing this and some connectivity from the ventral premotor that is going through the supplementary motor area that are in the, in the deep up of the insula. We characterize this uh, with the same approach and you can start it to say what I just jumping on on the, few, on the previous data. That the organization, this is clear show by analysis of uh, latency, current intensity, number of pulses. To make the, the story short, you do not have a localized, a specific uh, uh, site for each muscles. This part of the cortex is organized in functional Q-related area, which are intermingled together. This is the base for the brain by which is able to uh, compensate and modulate activity. And in fact, this can be traced in a functional area, as you can see here. Um, how you can get this inf information and bring this information into the theater? Actually, if you, I show you that if the patient is, uh, of course, resting, the patient is not really in the best condition to be investigated. You need the patient to do something. And the best is to ask the patient to perform a task. The task is, for example, grasping or playing with a screwdriver. This is what we have done, actually. And uh, we um, elicit uh, uh, specific interference uh, by a stimulator, and either with the low frequency, with the painful technique, or the high frequency. It doesn't change too much. Uh, what is changed is the fact that you have a different partner of uh, uh, modulation of the, how the muscles, how the motor programming is organized in this area. And uh, you can see here that, for, uh, for example, for the ventral premotor and the connectivity in front of the frontal lobe, uh, what you have is a sort of inhibition of movement, which in terms of specific uh, physiology is not an inhibition, is actually a change in the motor programming. This, in fact, has an effect on an, an impact in, in terms of uh, clinical data because you can see that, as you guys told you, if you ask the patient to perform the task on the cortex at the subcortical level, you can elicit, you can show it, um, where this connectivity is going and is actually the the uh, um, posterior part, part of the uh, insula. By the way, the same connectivity is also involved in, for example, in performing uh, Q-related tasks, like, for example, um, asking, uh, just repeating a series of items or a series of numbers. This is, this is telling you that this connectivity that, of course, evolved from the connectivity in the monkey that is related to the mirror activity is just a sort of uh, um, large area that is performing different type of action. We have just to add this type of different task to this connectivity to uh, realize what the function is. And in fact, by doing this, you can clearly depict um, the superior and of course, posterior border of the resection where you, uh, that helps you in entry in the middle and in the posterior part of the insula. Okay. Few questions, few data about the anterior part. You guys uh, told you about the function of the uncinatus. Um, in the same area, you can elicit in both hemisphere, particularly in the not dominant one, uh, automatic movement. And uh, you can elicit also um, chewing and swallowing uh, responses. These are responses with a long latency. It's telling you that there is a line going from the, from the deep of the amygdala, going up through the temporal stem, going to the caudatus and to the deep uh, insula. The, the, same, the, same, the same region, this is a sort of physiological of, uh, a physiological marker because the same area is also involved in the monkey and also in men in more specialized function like, for example, 
uh, emotion or also pain that can be elicit in all these with a, a specific component in all this area. And uh, Tommaso in the, this afternoon will also tell you that the same area is also involved in the inhibition of automatic responses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bello. Now we can